my generation still likes to feel the newsprint. Yes. You know, get my hands thinky. Uh, I do too. <laughs> but that's going to go away. Um, and, and, and then what's left, I don't know. There will, I hope, always be a place for some print because I think it complements one another. And the thing about print is that you can hand it around. Now, of course, people just say, did you see on an email or in a text message, did you see this or what goes viral on the Internet is important. This is the first, the best line about the new technology is that it's the <coughs> first time in which um, when you have the kind of profound change that this new technology brings to us, kids are teaching their parents how to drive. <laughs> I get up in the morning and read the Financial Times of London, edited by a friend of mine. And if there's something going today, for example, Margaret Thatcher dying, I wanted to see what the London newspapers had to say about that. Um, it means that we no longer can be couch potatoes. You have to work a lot harder at it uh, because it's just not a matter of picking up the Miami papers or the Tampa papers or tuning into the NBC or ABC or CBS or any of the cable affiliates. If you really want to be informed, you've got to develop a kind of checklist for yourself about what holds up, what's credible, what, what's useful to me. I find a lot of people who are, as I describe it, are still kind of chasing all of this, all of these outlets, not quite certain about how to deal with them. But if you develop a kind of discipline, to put it in simple terms, if, if you were as, um, as aggressive about determining what's useful to you in terms of where you get your information and how it holds up, as you are in terms of buying a flat screen television set or a pair of running shoes. You'll be pretty well served. I think broadcast journalism will always be in place. Obviously, the landscape is a lot different than it was when I began. Um, there were really only two networks in those days. ABC was not yet a player when I started. It was that long ago. And I was the only one I knew of my cohort of uh, university friends who decided to go into this business. I was a political science major. I'd been editor of a school newspaper, and, and I'd worked, actually, in a television newsroom when I was still in school. And I really wanted to do this because I thought it would um, allow the network to pay me to go see the world. And then I realized I overwished on that account. And I saw a lot more of it than I intended to. Um, and now it's changed profoundly, obviously, because of cable and broadcast news. And the important thing is that there's a kind of um, synergy, if you will, between the new media and what we do. And that will go on for some time. Now, this is not going to disappear. Print's going to be reformed in a different way. And by reformed, I mean it'll take new forms. Uh, so there will always be a place for journalism because it's the oxygen of society. People want to know what's going on. They need the information to make decisions about their own lives and they'll just be able to get it in, in an entirely different fashion. Well, I don't, I don't necessarily say there will not be another greatest generation. I, we do not want to put anyone through what they had to go through to become what they became. It began with the Great Depression. Uh, I always uh, indicate that that really was the, those were the formative years of the greatest generation. They went through sacrifice and deprivation. For all the prosperity that you now see in Florida, when I wrote about Sam Gibbons and other people from here, they talked about no jobs and people, you know, everybody was working in the groves, picking and trying to get a day job of some kind. You didn't have the explosive growth along the coastline. So what I say to a new generation of young people coming of age, I do two commencements every year because I kind of want to decide what I think and what I hope that they'll be thinking about. It really is up to them now to create their own greatness, and there are lots of issues out there. I was just uh, talking to Nightly News this morning about the importance of doing something about that young foreign service officer who was killed in Afghanistan over the weekend, that young woman. She is in many ways emblematic of this generation that doesn't get enough attention about what they're doing. When I go out into the downrange in Afghanistan and Iraq, not necessarily in the front lines, but a lot of the key players are women, and a lot of young people are out there working for NGOs and refugee issues and health and education. Uh, and that's part of the way that you form greatness. It's the renewal of America constantly, that we feel that we have a, a place in the world.
when Bobby Kennedy was killed in 1968, now remember this is less than five years after his brother had been killed, uh, the next day we were st still pretty much in shock about what we were seeing and what we were reporting on. The motorcade left uh, Good Samaritan Hospital in Los Angeles and it headed for the airports. And David let that motorcade play out on the screen without saying anything. And we were riveted just by the picture. You didn't really need to say anything. And then he said very briefly, for the second time in less than five years, a Kennedy widow is in a limousine behind a hearse carrying her husband's body to a western airport so it can be born to the nation's capital and the morning can begin. And then he shut up. That was almost a textbook on how you should describe events on television. You know, just compliment what you're seeing and let the audience then yeah. absorb what they've seen and conclude with their own thoughts. When you go on the air now, or when you go into print, most of the people who are reading or watching already know what happened. Margaret Thatcher will not be a news bulletin tonight at 6.30. So you have to tell them, what does it mean? 